Welcome to the Predictable Revenue Podcast, where frontline sales leaders teach you how to build and scale an outbound sales team. Welcome to a live version of the Predictable Revenue Podcast. Today, we've got Max Altshuler, a guy who probably doesn't need an introduction on the sales podcast, but I'm going to do it anyway, just because you know this is the only chance I get to talk. Uh, so Max, founder of Sales Hacker, now a part of Outreach. Um, you're also the chief evangelist for Sutra, which is a coffee alternative. Healthy coffee alternative. Yep. Cool. And VP marketing at Outreach. Yeah. Man, do you, are you ever at home or are you just always on the road <laughs> or at the office? So before Outreach, we were, uh, I was living in Miami in the winters and the Hamptons in the summer. So we were completely remote business and Sutra was remote as well. So uh, that was a different lifestyle. Now I'm on the road. I'm in Las Vegas right now at the Gartner Sales and Marketing Conference. Got to go back downstairs after this one. But uh, yeah, I'm on, uh, I'm on the road for the next 30 days, uh, then back to Seattle for a week and still trying to figure out where I'm going to live. Um, acquisition happened August 1st. It's been a blast so far, whole new set of challenges and, and learnings, but um, something I feel very confident in. So uh, yeah, pretty happy. That's great, man. We've, we've got a record. I think... I mean, we booked this before you joined Outreach, before we knew about everything. <laughs> and we, I try not to get uh, too many guests from one company on. Yeah. But we've just, there's just had so many really great people. And I'm like, hey, can you, you know, who's the next person I should have on? And they're like, oh, well, you got to have Steve Ross on or oh, you got to have Mark on. And, awesome. That's okay. what I like to hear. So yeah. I, think you're, I think you're the fifth person from Outreach that's been on the show. Hell yeah. Like it. <laughs> that's what I like to hear. That's momentum right there. Yeah, it is some serious momentum for sure. Cool. So today we're going to talk about buyer psychology and sort of how it fits into the sales process. Now you're called, do you want to, I, I think my thoughts were we start with sales process and then sort of add on the buyer psychology, you know, once we've sort of built that lattice work, what do you think? Yeah, sure. Go for it. So I'm, I'm curious. So before we jump, like we want to talk about systemizing your sales process, right? Because without without any systems or without any regularity, you know, none of this really is going to have, a, have the impact that you want. So what's, talk to me about when you're looking at a sales process, whether, whether it's yours or company you're advising, you know, what's your methodology to sort of make sense of it and bring some order to the chaos? Yes, the first thing you need to do is really understand your, your buyer. So your ideal customer profile, um, but also how they like to, to interact. So if you're Ideal, you know, all right, you do the groundwork to find your ideal customer profile. So you figure out that it's sales operations people because you sell, you know, a sales ops piece of software like a um, maybe like sales team activity tracking and analytics. So you sell to sales ops, not sales executives or, or you know, sales people. So now you figured out your ideal customer profile. You got to figure out where those people live, where they like to interact and, and, and how they like to buy. So sales ops people, ops people are different than executives or salespeople. Salespeople live out of their cell phones. Executives might be on the road to live out of their cell phones. Ops people might be people who live in, you know, two screens. So how are you going to sell to them versus how you're going to sell to the to a um, to an executive or a salesperson is pretty different. You know, so you're 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 not going to text them because they're not out of their their cell phone. Maybe you'll connect with them on LinkedIn because they are, um, they're in their, they're in their laptop or they're in their, their screens. Maybe you'll send them an email. Maybe you're not going to call them because again, they're not out of their phone. Maybe you'll send them one-to-one -one personalized video because they can get that out of their email. So finding different ways to connect with your buyer and, and figuring out who your buyer is, is the first piece. And then you can build your sales process around that. So here's how, here's who my buyer is. Here's how they like to buy. Let's go out and figure out, all right, what, what is our, our process look like from here? What would a successful um, engagement look like with somebody on the other end? And you can start mapping that out and actually doing that without buying any technology. So, you know, send the emails, make the phone calls, um, you know, send the personalized gifts, you know, whether it's through Amazon or something else, um, send the personalized video, you know, however you're going to send it using, you know, either free technology um, or, you know, just your, your basic resources. But I recommend everybody doing that before they spend a dollar on buying uh, solutions. Figure out what it would look like first before you buy, then say, okay, well, this works. How do we get a lot more juice out of it? How do we make it a lot more effective or more efficient? 
then you can start layering the technology. But if you buy the technology first without having a process in place, you're actually going to end up shooting yourself in the foot. It's going to take a lot more time to ramp and onboard. You're going to be wasting a lot of money on you know the seat licenses that aren't getting used appropriately to start. So that's how I recommend really setting it up from from the like very very you know bottom floor. I love that you start process first as opposed to tool first. I think I've I've jumped into a lot of sales orgs that have started tool first and you're like, oh, well, why are you doing this one thing this way? Oh, well, the tool sort of dictated that we had to do that. And so you, what, what ends up happening is it's, it's like you're, you decided to go for a swim and you just jumped in the ocean. You didn't really figure out where you want and said, I'll just swim into the current and wherever that takes me is where I'm going to end up, which is, is not necessarily the right way of doing things. And I love that you're, you talk about doing it manually, you know, the calls, like everything manually, no tech. Um, we started in spreadsheets, you know, when we, we first kicked this off. And obviously the goal was to get in Salesforce eventually, but, you know, by starting off with the, the minimum amount of investment in time investment in tooling as you can to actually get something going, you'll actually see what that process naturally is going to look like without any confines of a, of a tool being enforced on top of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a, and I think that's the only re- way to really go. I mean, I've seen companies, um, I've seen sophisticated sales guys go into companies as the first sales hire and their default is to like rely on technology way too early instead of understanding the sales process. So they go out and they buy what they know, you know, from the previous company that they worked at because it worked there and then they set it all up and they're like, Oh crap. Like I didn't go through the, the fundamentals first. Like I should have done that first. Mm -hmm. And then they sit there and they they're paying, you know, probably two or three months worth of SaaS, you know, their, their stack that they, they could have saved. Um, or they run really fast into a, into a wall that doesn't scale because they set it up, but they didn't think through those things correctly from the very beginning. Mm-hmm. And so, so now you're changing sort of midstream. You, you've got a tool or a system set up that you've probably spent some time, you know, configuring yeah. to work this way. And you're like, oh, actually, it needs to turn left instead of right at this yeah. juncture. Yeah, yeah. So, so you map out, so you do it manually, you map out your, your process. Um, you, what comes next? Yeah. Um, I think you, once you have like your process and your foundation set, then you can start layering the sales technology. You build out your stack. Uh, you might want to talk to, you know, advisors or friends or people. If you're really starting from scratch, you don't have a lot of experience here um, and understand like what is, What are the top line items? What are the things you need in your stack first before anything else? So you need a CRM, you need a, uh, you know, sales engagement tool, you need contact, uh, contact data, you need your sales navigator. Do you need, um, you know, uh, conversational intelligence or chat or, you know, anything else? Like what are the things that you think you're going to need and how do you get some advice from other people who've, who built it from scratch? Um, And then according to your process, where does it look like you can get the most, efficiency right off the bat from building that process. The next step after that, that I like to go to is really starting to nail the messaging. So once you have the process set up and you've had ideated, you understand your ICP, you understand, um, you know, your, how you're going to set up your stack. Uh, you can really start focusing on, you know, all right, well, what are the pain points and the objections and things that I'm dealing with for what I'm selling? Uh, and, and how do I get ahead of those things? So how do I work with marketing to make sure that our message is getting ahead of, um, you know, what I'm selling into. So it's already there. So I have the collateral I need, champion empowerment collateral, things like that in the deal cycle that are going to, that are going to make it easier for me to sell depending on, on the, on the, uh, deal sizes, of course. And also the messaging that you're going to send out, you know, on the, on the first email, LinkedIn connection, phone call, voicemail, all that kind of stuff. What are you testing? You want to have a couple different variations of that. So you want to make sure that, you know, when you, you understand your ICP's plight and all the things that are wrong with, you know, their current processes and what you're selling them, and then be able to work those into the, the, the engagements that you're creating um, as you're connecting with these people. For me, I'm all about uh, omni-channel right now. You know, it's, um, you know, everybody was like cold calling is dead and emails working now it's cycles and, and it gets saturated because everybody writes about it and it's what's working. And then so everybody goes on it and then the next thing starts working. So cold calling stopped working because everybody was doing it. Then they moved to email and everybody's doing that. Now they're moving to LinkedIn and it's always going to cycle through. But I think it's really important that you make sure you're on every channel. Mm-hmm. So as you set up your process to be on every channel, you're also understanding what's working and what's not. You need to be religiously A-B testing 
everything that you're doing, the entire sequence that you're setting up and the, and the engagement process is one AB test and the messaging you're using during those conversations is another AB test. So making sure that, you know, if you're using pain point A in one email, you use pain point B in another and you, you are checking those open rates and click through rates, um, you know, and reply rates even to, to make sure that uh, what you're talking about is resonating with the person on the other side. Great. So we're, you've got the, you've, you've layered in your ideal customer profile. You're talking about the buyer personas and, and narrowing on narrowing in on who they are. The next step is you're mapping out their sales process sort of start to finish. Now we're starting to move a little bit more tactical into figuring out what that messaging um, is, is, is actually going to look like what channels yeah. they're going to be available on. What, what stage do you start to get into sort of the, the buyer psychology? Like when like yeah. a, objection handling is, is yeah. pretty so, key. So you want to, so, and then I'm a big fan of this because I I've done this at startups and I think at any stage, this is important. You want to get, you want to get to a point where you can build momentum as fast as possible and then work in progress, everything else. So the only way to really do it is to get your MVP, you know, your minimum viable product out there. It's like lean sales, you know, get your, get your process up and running, get your tech stack layered on, get your original messaging and your hypothesis, hypotheses and things that you think are, are going to resonate and start getting that out there. Let that settle, let that test, let the, you know, let that um, marinate a little bit on your audience, use those AB tests to, to define your message. And while you're doing that, get out of the office and, and talk to people and have conversation with them and ask them for advice and ask them, you know, just honest questions. Don't try and sell them to figure out what those, those questions need to be, what those pain points really are. So while you're at, while you're AB testing your messaging, you're learning what's resonating and what's working, but you're also getting out of the building and have those like customer development conversations with people uh, as you're running the sales process. And that's where you can start layering in, you know, your sales psychology where it's like, Oh, okay. So like, I understand that this person's had a, a, a really big pain point in this area. What are some things that I can do to get creative to like highlight that pain point? What are some things I can do to understand, understand their pain point around that area deeper? Are there people that I can talk to within their company? Are there screenshots that I can take, um, you know, and, and send to their company? I had a, I had a, uh, I actually spoke at a women, women entrepreneurs event um, last week in Seattle, which was really interesting. And it was me and like 25 other women in the audience and then two women on the panel with me. And one of the women asked, um, she does a consulting service for companies around culture, but like also making sure people are acting like gentlemanly and, and civil and aren't, you know, going over the lines in this me too environment that we're in and rightfully so somebody needs to be doing this for companies. She's like, how do I, how do I sell this to businesses? And I was like, well, what you should do is you should take a screenshot of a headline of a VC firm or a startup that got in trouble recently and just send it off to VCs and say, don't let this happen to one of your portfolio companies and just put the head, the screenshot in your email. And that's what I mean by like, like sales psychology where you could read a bunch of sentences, but that's not going to help as much of a screenshot of a portfolio company or somebody's VC firm shooting themselves in the foot. It's all you need to put in there. It's like, I can help with this. And you put that screenshot in there and it's like, hit me up to learn more. And VCs will then pass you on to their portfolio company saying, hey, hey you should do this training. You know, at, at least at the very least, like one, it makes us look really good to our employees that we care about making sure that we have their backs and we want to create a culture where like this is important to us. You know, you can start talking about that stuff once you, you know, have the meeting and get in there. But like that one screenshot right there speaks so much louder than any bullet points you're going to put in an email. And that's the area of sales, sales psychology I love, which is how do you get creative and get your point across in when there's so much noise and when, you know, people don't know how to write cold emails or, or, you know, do cold calls or send, send things out there and don't even know what messaging to start with. Don't know what's going to resonate. Don't know what people's motivations are. Um, that's the fun part of sales. That's when it gets back to that art. That's, that's the stuff that like you can AB test all you want, but you know, if you're not asking the right questions and you're not understanding how to, to um, really like understand what their answers really mean, you're just, ne you're not going to get very far. And so if this is not something that you are native to, and if it's like something you have to do as a founder, but you're never going to be good at, 
the best thing you can really do is start building a network of advisors and people who are good at it and just ask them like, Hey, what, what questions do I need to ask? Ask them for advice. That's great. I, I love how you're, you're getting to that. Like the example, you get right to that aha, aha moment, that magic moment of clarity. I need to do something about this. And it's really hard to do that using just text alone. Say, Hey, this, this, this. Yeah. Um, so in order to get there, you really need to, need to understand. And you were talking about customer development question or doing some customer development interviews. Um, this is a sales podcast. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how many of the you know, salespeople here, sales leaders here have gone through sales development inter- or customer development interviews. Can you talk to me about what that looks like and maybe yeah. some example questions that you've asked? Yeah. Well, in the, in the founder VC realm, it's, you know, ask, ask for money, get advice, ask for advice, get money. But I think, there's nothing stronger in sales than just asking people questions about what they think about something. And, and it's, it's conversational sales. It's, uh, honestly, if you're, if you're cold emailing me and you want me to respond, ask me a question. Don't send anything else. I don't want bullet points. I don't want stats. I don't want anything. I want you to understand my pain and ask me a question about that. Just ask me a quick, simple question about something that is relevant to me is a pain for me right now. And I will respond, with an answer. That answer might be like, yeah, not right now, but check back in a couple months. But like at least you'll get an answer because it's quick and easy. I don't have to read anything. I, if I have to read stuff and it's too long, it's just going to go, you know, straight into the can. But asking that question, you know, I've had people reach out to me and congratulate me on the acquisition and say like, you know, congratulations, been following your success for a long time. Like what's next? I'll answer that. And so if you're a random sales rep and you send me that email, and you're genuinely interested, I'll answer that. Like that, that's a question. Let's start a conversation. Cool. Sure. I'll probably answer it on LinkedIn. I'm not sure if I'll answer on, on, on email, but I answer everything I get on LinkedIn. If it's, as long as it's like well thought through and not, not, a, not a pitch. And even if it's well thought through and a pitch, I still probably won't answer on LinkedIn if I'm not interested. I just don't, I don't have enough time. I get like 50 messages a day, but the ones that start a conversation, that's when it gets really interesting. So like ask for advice and, and, and I'm a hard person to, to maybe get that advice from like on a one-off basis, but I'm sure you can, you know, build a friend network, create a community, do something to be able to start asking people for their advice on, on what you're doing. And you don't have to be a founder to do this. You don't even have to be, you don't have to be a VP of sales. You could be a lone IC individual contributor rep that, all right, I, I don't need to go to this conference to start selling people left and right ask them questions and then get them to the, the pain point, get them to it. So like one of the, my favorite things to do at a conference is you just start a conversation with someone, start talking. Okay. Start talking about their business. What do you do? What is it? You know, what do you do in your business? Oh, okay. Link those little conversations and close the loop eventually. So, you know, you start talking to someone and you're like, Oh, what do you do? What's your role? Oh, you're in sales ops for this company. What keeps you up at night? you know, simple question like that. Oh, well, you know, I really hate data entry, blah, blah, blah. We have this problem with Salesforce. It's like, oh, that's interesting. Can you then start connecting the dots to what you eventually sell based on the conversation that you're having? And if you could do that and you do that really well and really smooth, you can do that on or offline very easily. And that's my favorite way to, to sell in general, whether it's through email or here. And I, and I happen to now be a part of a company that sells sales software and I'm somebody who has a wealth of knowledge in the sales space, having run sales hacker for five years and then actually just like geeking out on this stuff genuinely. So fortunately for me, that works really well. Um, and I'm not a salesperson, so I don't get comped, which, you know, maybe I should renegotiate, but, um, <laughs> I should do that as a marketer. Um, but that's my favorite way to, to, to get into these conversations and ask for the advice, get the advice, get to know the people, get to understand their problems and then eventually link that conversation, whether it's in that, that direct conversation that I'm having right then and there or at a later time. And because I'm, I'm helping them think through things or I'm having a valuable conversation with them, I earn the right to continue that conversation and eventually get to you know, what I'm pitching. And, and I like the, the way you phrase it there, that you, you earn the right to sort of continue that conversation. It's not, let me ask you two questions and then jump in with my pitch yeah. at, at the conference. Um, I, we had a question from, from Ann asking, you know, some examples of example questions. And I, what I, I think you've sort of answered this, but I just wanted to jump in and, and like cover some things that um, you, we might talk about on a customer, a typical customer development interview, right? So they're all going to be generally open-ended questions, right? 
that's going to be, you know, how, how do you do this? You know, what do you do about that? How do you feel about this types of questions? And they're all going to be specific to your, not specific to your product, but specific to the pain that your product solves. Yeah. Right. And so I, I love a simple one. Like what keeps you up at night? Like that's, that's my go-to. Um, and if I'm one of my favorite ones, if, uh, if they are evaluating, um, switching from a competitor to our platform, it's like, all right, if you're running this evaluation from scratch right now and you had neither one, what would be most important to you? Like, mm -hmm. how do you get, I don't know if you ever read this book, it's called, um, the four disciplines of execution. And there's thing called, there are things called lead indicators and, um, lagging indicators. And, you know, a lead indicator would be something that goes like an answer to one of those deep questions that like gets to the root of the why. And a lag would be just the first question that's like, oh, why? It's like, well, why are you, why are you afraid of the dark? Like something simple like that. It's because like, oh, I'm scared. That's the first why. Why are you scared? Because when I was a kid, you know, something popped out at me and it was like a raccoon in my bedroom or something like that. It's like, okay, now you peeled the onion back and you got to the second why. And then there's usually like a third deeper why, which is like, all right, well, but okay, a raccoon came into your room and it popped up. It's like, that made me feel unsafe because it came like, because now I know that something can get to me when I'm sleeping and I'm in a vulnerable state. All right, now that's the third why. So your lead indicator is that deep down third why. So when you're, you're, you're asking these questions, you want to make sure you're getting that root answer, that answer that's like that they feel vulnerable at night because they're sleeping and it's dark. Um, it's the four disciplines of execution. But if you just, if you only got the first answer, it's because I'm scared, you wouldn't know what pain to solve. You wouldn't know what to solve for. And that was just like an off the cuff, you know, example right there. When you get into these deal cycles, it goes much deeper than just like, oh, we don't like this. It's like, well, why don't you like that? Like, what are the things like dig into those things? It's much more, it's much easier if you can figure out the questions to ask that immediately get to that deeper why instead of having to ask multiple questions to drill down into it. So just mm -hmm. coming up with some of those questions and, and over time, like, I don't think there are a lot of like crazy silver bullets here. It really depends on, you know, what your, what your pain point you're solving for is and everything else. But you can, you could find a way to develop those questions that are, that are somewhat can, but also feel authentic. What keeps you up at night? It never, when I say it, it never feels canned. And maybe it's the time that I bring it up in the conversation because I've already like earned the right to ask that question. But you know, if you, you get in a conversation with someone's like, what do you do? Sales ops for XYZ company. Oh, cool. That must be a really fun job. Oh yeah. You know, I do X, Y, and Z. It's like, oh man, well, you know, if you do all those cool things, like, you know, what, what are your problems? Like what, what are the one things, what's the, what are the few things that keep you up at night? It's like, oh, it's funny you asked that. I was just dealing with X, Y, and Z. And also mm -hmm. people have to talk about the problems. So it's another great way to just like get into that conversation without, um, and, and, and be able to carry it forward with, um, without it being, um, Hey, talk, tell me about your problems. You know, it's just yeah. casual. Love it. I, I'm curious just to get tactical for, tactical for a second. Cause you talked about using this over email. How would you go about taking that, that question about sales ops and translate that into a, a good email template? Yeah, I'm not sure that I would. Um, I think I would use email in this. It, it depends. I'd say it depends on your deal size. If you're selling SMBs, you got to get a lot more done through less touches. So mm -hmm. you got to make sure that your, your case is being heard and you're, you're using, you know, almost when you're selling it, SMBs, email is inbound inbox marketing. Like you're, you're hoping people open your email, <laughs> check it out. Maybe you get a couple of replies or something like that. But like if you're selling SMBs, you're probably doing a lot more spray and pray, especially if you're a small company. And you really can't afford to do more than that in SMB. You can't tailor every email and SMB for, for deals that are less than 6K a year, you're losing money if you're spending salespeople's time tailoring emails. I mean, you, you just can't afford to do that in SMB. You need to have, a, you need to have an inbound motion. Um, for mid-market deals, which is the next level up, you get a little more tailored. You maybe do the 10, 80, 10, or you get a little more personalized here and there. Maybe you have some target accounts that you go after that are more personalized than others. And then for the other ones that are outside of your you know, main targets, 
you find a way to, um, you know, to throw a little bit of a, a mix in there and you use inbound as, as part of, um, as part of, uh, as part of your touches, you know, to, to get you where you want to go. It's when you get into commercial and enterprise and you move up market that you really start to like focus on every account and every individual inside of those accounts in a much more meaningful way. And that's when you start to ask these questions. That's when you start to like drill into these pain points and these problems and, Marketing is your best friend for SMB and mid-market because they're helping you almost like automate that process and mm-hmm. like, okay, here's the pain points for this batch of customer. And, you know, we, you can't afford to spend that much time selling when you're selling your sales efficiency numbers will be, will be terrible. You will need to raise a lot of money to stay in business. There's no way you could be profitable if that's how you're selling to SMB and lower mid-market. As you go up market, you can afford to really, spend time on those questions, spend time on those people, spend it. So it really depends on what your market segment is. And, and as you go up market and you start asking those questions, you're not only going to be emailing, you're going to connect on LinkedIn, you're going to provide value. Um, you're going to, you know, you should be building your brand on LinkedIn. So people like that see it, you should be providing value for people before you ask those questions. Hey, saw this article and thought of you, um, you should be reading, you know, if it's bigger companies, you know, they're K ones. Um, so you can get the risk and out, you know, like what you can find out what keeps a company up at night publicly. If they're a public company, you mm-hmm. uh, searching their K ones. So if you go to it, it's a, just Google like public company K ones, you go to it. I think it's like section two. It'll show that it'll show you what their risks are stated by that company. So the company will go in. They have a section right there that says risks. This is all public information because it's a public company. So the shareholders are, have a right to understand like, you know, literally what's keeping them up at night as a company. So if you look at those and you track those for long enough, you might find some that pop up immediately in your ICP. And if you look at those and you don't need to track them for long enough and you just look at any month, I'm sure you can connect the dots to something that's keeping them up at night or is considered a risk for them. That is also, that can also somehow connect to what you're selling. And so that's an interesting way to do it for commercial and enterprise companies. That's great. We had um, actually Zora on the, we're doing, we're doing a, so we're updating impossible to inevitable with Aaron and uh, we're doing some new case studies, getting some fresh content to inject into it. Um, Cause a few of them just didn't age super well. Uh, Zenefits being the, the sort of one big one that was sort of thro- throughout there. Um, and at the time of publishing, they were like taken off like a rocket ship. And I think a few months after, um, everything came out. So we're updating it, getting a couple of things, um, you know, some updates in there. We had the people from Zora on with their VP of marketing and VP of sales development. And they were talking about how they actually publish, you know, uh, they report on number amount of deals over hundred K like, that's what they report to the street. The number of ops, like that's, that's a seriously granular level of detail you can get into for one of these public companies. And you can see if that's trending up or down, you know, and it's just one sort of example that popped into my head. Mm-hmm. Um, because you're right, there's in the K1s, even in the S1s of companies that are just going public, there's quite a bit of detail in there as well. That'll give you quite a bit of the historical, you know, before they were public. Yeah. So I, I just want to pivot for a second here because I want to move to talking about how do we put this into practice on a day-to-day basis. Um, but I want to take, I want everybody to just take a minute and jump into that Q&A box. And at, at the top of the hour, we're going to transition to everybody answering everybody's questions here. Um, so take, take a couple minutes, hit up that Q and a box. Let's hear what you have this. Let's hear the questions you have for max can be related to buyer psychology sales process. I mean, the guy's got, you know, pretty, pretty strong knowledge across the board. So we're seeing some good questions come in already. I love it. Yeah. If everybody just throw your questions in that box now and uh, we'll finish, you know, our section on, you know, how do we put this into practice on a day to day basis? What does that look like? Cool. So is that the question? Mm Hmm. How do we put this into practice on a day-to-day basis? Um, hmm. So like broad, general, this well, in a so practice <laughs> for everybody's businesses. Like, yeah, I mean, it's... Um, I, so I feel like maybe I'll add some context here just yeah. to help us narrow in on. I feel like yeah. we, we've talked about some learning and leverage, like learning quite a bit about our customers. Right. We want to, we want to do lots of research. We want to find out what their pain points are. You know, we've already talked a little bit about inserting some of those pain points into, 
you know, into our email templates or into, you know, the, the scripts we might use at a conference. But when it comes down to, you know, a day-to-day -day basis, when we're on calls, when we're looking at, you know, what marketing materials do we need support with, when we're looking at, you know, how are we going to, you know, how are we going to close this deal? How are we going to handle this objection, right? Like, how does that, um, how do you sort of align that? And then maybe even on the calls, like when we're on a call with a prospect, you know, what is it that we're, you know, what are some things that we can do to, um, to really show that we, we've done our homework, we've done this research and that we actually care enough. We've done, you know, we've looked into, Hey, I read your K1. I understand that, you know, you've got some pain, some challenges here. Um, yeah. how do you, how do you bring that up on a call? So your sales enablement person should be helping you with all of this if you're at a decent sized company. If you're too young, too early for a sales enablement person and you have to do this on your own. Um, yeah, for, first step is to go, I think this is what your sales enablement person would build and they would either use some technology to do it or use a spreadsheet, but you could build a criteria matrix for you know certain accounts where it's like, all right, I need to go check out all my public sources. So I need to go check out the K1 statements. I need to go check out Crunchbase, PitchBook, Owler, um, a quick Google search, uh, you know, the Twitter profiles for the, or Twitter handles for the feeds, for the, um, you know, key stakeholders, decision makers, whatever it is, and build that out, you know, like a little dossier for yourself. Now there are some apps that give you, you know, a, a, a smaller version of that. Um, uh, man, I'm, I'm off my app game on this stuff, but like, you know, I'm sure. So I, I think outreach does it, but I'm, you know, there are LinkedIn plugins and things like that for Gmail that you can use. Um, so you want to have all your information at your fingertips in one place. And then you can cross reference all that information, figure out what the pain points are based on the K ones, figure out what um, their funding rounds are. I mean, Bant back in the day was budget authority need timing. And that was how you qualified people on a discovery call. You could almost find, out if they have budget, if you're speaking to the authority, if they have a need and if it's the right timing, just by looking at crunch base, pitch book, internet, K ones, all that kind of stuff. So you almost do your little like bank qualification on your own before you speak to somebody. And then you can figure out, all right, what's keeping them up at night. You can figure out, all right, well, you know, they just raised the $160 million in funding or they just IPO. You can figure out, um, you know, I think the K one tells you a need. I think LinkedIn tells you the authority. I think, um, you know, Crunchbase tells you uh, budget. Um, K1 can also tell you timing. So you can get pretty far along the way by building this kind of list for yourself for these accounts. And then once you have that, you've kind of cross-referenced it all against each other. Then you're ready to, to, to reach out and, and, um, and, and contact that account. And you're not going to just contact one person. You're not going to just contact them one, one time. You're going to build a a sequence um, that is, all right, I'm going to do a phone call, then a voicemail, then an email that alludes to the voicemail, then connect on LinkedIn and do an in-mail, then send personalized video and, you know, maybe a handwritten letter or something like that. You're going to do omni-channel and you're going to build it into a sequence and you're not going to do one person. You're going to do the people in the organization that you can, uh, from your knowledge, assume are the decision makers um, and the key players in that deal. And you want to triangulate that as best as possible. So first is your fact finding mission. Second is, you know, putting together the, the messaging and, and what you're going to go out there with, you know, on that account. Third is setting up that, that sequence. Um, and, you know, maybe an even third is also understanding, you know, who in that, who in that organization do you want to reach out to and in what order, uh, in what order do you want to reach out to them? Um, so a little, uh, a little complicated if you're not, if you've never done it before, but, you know, if you read Hacking Sales and Predictable Revenue and, um, you know, jump on saleshacker.com, I'm sure you can find a, find a lot of it, you know, there piece by piece together. I, I think totally right. And I, I'm a big fan of Hacking Sales, obviously Predictable Revenue, but I, I've, I've read just about every sales book that comes out. And I, I really like the level of detail you got down to in, in Hacking Sales. I think that was, there, there aren't too many books that get as tactical and are as helpful. You know, there's a lot of, a books that it sort of exist up here and 
I mean, if you've read, you know, some of the basics like the Sandler and the Miller Hyman stuff from 20, 30 years ago, you know, you'll see bits and pieces of, of each book in, in every sort of iteration of next sales book that, that comes out. But I like that your, yours was, okay, this is the current state of things. This is what you'll learn. And this is, you can put some of this into practice right now. So I, yeah. big shout out to the book there. Um, yeah, talking about, you know, putting things into practice, uh, I'd love to, to just sort of end on, you know, there's all these things, there's all this research um, that we've done, you know, we've got them on the phone, but it's all useless unless we have a good call, right? And so much of that is, is not just standing up and having a script of, let me tell you about this, let me, tell, let me run you through my demo, right? I find so much of it is sort of asking good questions and, you know, really get to know the, the prospect over the phone. What are, what are some, what's some advice you have for like how to actually, um, you know, how to, how to best sort of develop that sort of relationship with somebody you've only known over a video call or a phone, phone call. So you're saying that you've only ever spoken to them on the phone and this is a, a second touch or this is the first, this is the first call off the yeah. bat. Let's say first call. First call, you reached out over LinkedIn, email, you know, phone, whatever, um, and you've booked this sort of first discovery call. Are we a fit call? Yeah. Um, so, so two things. Um, one, adding to the uh, level of psychology, is the time that you call, and two is uh, just basic sales. Like, don't try and close the deal on the first call. So the first one is, if I call you at nine fifteen in the morning, the odds that you're in a meeting are much higher than if I call you at 9.55 because you might have a half hour or an hour long meeting that starts at 9 or 9.30, but you're much more likely to get out early and have some extra time in your hour at 9.55 than you are to be not in a meeting at 9.15. So just making sure that when you are calling, you're, you, like, let's use common sense. Call, call it the 55 marker on the hour. Um, you can use a platform, you know, I know it's outreach, but um, outreach has the uh, power dialer where you can call from a local number. Um, use a platform like that might get you a little bit further, you know, because if you can call from my area code, then, you know, for some reason, mentally, I think that you are someone I might know. Um, now that's working less and less because everybody has cell phone numbers that they keep with them for their entire lives. So like, really, if you're calling me from my area code, I haven't lived there in 13 years. And like I, now I, I know, cause I'm a salesperson that you must be using a power dialer. Um, mm. cause nobody would be calling me from my area code. Um, at least it was a number I don't like. <laughs> yeah. I, if it's in your, if it's your area code, it's already in my address book. Yeah, exactly. I think like, um, the second piece is most people get on these calls and they're so gung ho about like, doing the discovery on that call, doing like getting the deal closed, like getting the deal moved along. It, your goal is just the next meeting. Like your goal, I mean, if you're actually in a position to be calling, that means your deal sizes are big enough. That means like you're not going to close a deal on one call. So that shouldn't be your goal. So get somebody on the phone long enough to get a meeting set up that they could actually carve out time to speak to you. Don't, don't do the whole rush thing, whatever. Um, so reframing, as that is your goal, what would you say? So you're not doing this whole like crazy convoluted pitch or whatever and, and like trying to get somebody to talk to you for 30 minutes and do discovery on that call. You call somebody, you make a connection, you use that time to set up a proper time to talk to them. Um, you say things like, what are, what's the best way to communicate with you going forward? What, what are the best ways? Who else should we have on this you know, call? What, what, um, get their calendar out right then and there and, and get them to set up a time for you right then and there. Uh, you know, it's the same thing with like Dreamforce, for example, if you're running a booth, you can sit there and do a demo with somebody, but it's going to go in one ear and out the other, or you can just set up time to do a demo and get the right people on it when they get back to their office and you spend 30 seconds with them on the show floor. So you can actually spend more time with other people versus spending 10 minutes with them on the show floor, which means you can't spend time with other people. Mm -hmm. So like the companies that understand how to successfully do this, are going to be the ones that spend their time efficiently. And, uh, and, and we'll end up selling a lot more based on, you know, how much they can throw at the problems. It's such a great point. I mean, the, the amount of times that you, you walk around a trade show or conference in the expo area and you just see people saying, Hey, can I show you my demo? Can I show you my demo? Can I show you my demo? It's like, well, 
I, I sat through, I think the best demo I've ever sat through was, I can't remember the rep's name, but I've got it hidden somewhere. Um, I'm sure he's making more than our company makes in, in general. Uh, cause he's, I think he's the top rep for Domo. And by the end of that, by the end of his demo, I was ready to buy Domo and I was working for a small startup. There's no way I should be, you know, even sitting in on that demo. Um, easily one of the best ones be, you know, they filled up a room and it was just sort of a, a bit of a spray and pray. Um, but you know, had they taken the time to ask me two or three questions to sort of calibrate, are, there, are you the right person? I'd have been kicked out of that room so fast. Yeah. Right. And then their, their rep could have spent time talking with the three or four real buyers that are yeah. actually in a buying window that can make a decision. There are at a company that's, that's yeah. what this is relevant for. It's low, it's low level of efficiency. Like your spot in there means that somebody else couldn't be there or your spot in there means that they couldn't drill down into things that were relevant to the three or four people that, you know, were in there that were super relevant. So. Yeah. And I'm sitting there taking up, taking up space, breathing, breathing air and asking yeah, yeah. questions that aren't super relevant, but I'm curious about them, but I'm just, I, you know, they honestly should have just kicked me out. I was like, but I, I wanted to know about this. I want to know about that. I'm like, what am I doing here? Why am I asking these questions? Taking up that, that enterprise air, uh, you know, reserved for enterprise companies only, man. Yeah. <laughs> Not for you. Exactly. Like when you're a kid and you're like, yeah, I'm going to go shopping for a private jet today, just yeah. on on the internet and you're looking like, this is the model. This is the G6 that I think would best yeah. suit my needs. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take, I'll make this my screensaver and that's about it. There you go. Yeah, exactly. Um, so pivoting into some of the questions, um, I'm sure I got your name wrong, but it looks like J rule, J rule to me. So let's go with that. I guarantee I have that wrong, but they're asking what books or courses do you recommend? Uh, yeah. So, uh, podcasts, obviously, obviously this podcast, um, salesengagement.com. We just launched the sales engagement podcast, which is a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about right now. Um, so we're doing, I think three episodes a week, but we'll get that to five. They're more like talk show style, but it's all about pretty much everything that we just went through. And it's, um, it's folks from outreach interviewing, um, you know, folks like you, Colin, or you've got Jake Dunlap, Trish Bertuzzi, Jocko Vandercouge. Um, so we're, we're, making sure we get all the heavy hitters on there, but also people that are doing the jobs at companies. So practitioners. Um, and then also the sales hacker podcast, which is a very VP sales CRO style podcast, uh, one episode a week, hour long podcast. Um, our host, Sam Jacobs, fantastic. We had Chris Degnan on there today, CRO of Snowflake doing 200 million plus in, uh, in revenue. Um, we had Dan Pink on there from to sell as human and drive. We had Chris Voss on there from never split the difference. That's a really good one. So podcasts, um, predictable revenue, hacking sales. We got a new book coming out called the new rules of sales engagement. Um, but other than that, uh, saleshacker.com. So other than the things that I'm personally involved in, <laughs> um, four disciplines of, of execution was a really good one, uh, for managing a business, but not so much for sales. Ultimate sales machine is a classic greatest salesman in the world by Og Mandino is more of a, um, sales like spirituality type thing with a really good book. First one I read in sales when I first started out, um, Chris Voss never split the difference is always a classic. Um, I think that's one of my favorite sales, non sales books. Yeah. Right. Mark Robert's sales acceleration formula is another really yeah. good one. You have to sort um, of skip the, the big F you to uh, outbound right in the middle of the sales acceleration formula. Yeah. He's like inbound, inbound, yeah, inbound. He's a HubSpot guy. Yeah, uh, of course. We'll let it slide. I, uh, you know, the, the guys who run the outbound conference all have some really good books and Jill Conrath too. So it's Jill Conrath. And then, uh, I think it's, um, Mike Weinberg, Mark Hunter, Anthony Iannarino and, uh, Jeb Blunt. Um, trying to think about other, uh, killer sales books. Yeah. I mean, it really just depends what you're, what you're looking to do. If you're an IC rogue rep, you know, you want to read kind of like never split the difference type stuff. If you're, you know, a, a startup salesperson, early stage, kind of help build the process, then you want these like process type books. Cool. And one non non sales book outside the world of sales. Oof, like a a leisure book or a business book, but not sales. Business book, not sales. Something that's had a big impact on you. I mean, everything by Tim Ferriss. Uh, he's, he's the go-to four hour from four hour work week to four hour body to four hour chef to tools of Titans. Um, he's awesome. I wrote a book that I self published called uh, career hacking for millennials. And it's about all, I mean, it's like quick, um, quick hits 
about all the things that I learned uh, along the way, kind of uh, building my companies and my career. And uh, I really love that one. And I think like everybody who reads it loves it, but it's not something I, I heavily promote. It's just kind of like more of a my, my gift or um, like a passion project or something like that. Um, I stepped on a lot of landmines in my career and, and avoided quite a few, but have always been very self reflective. And so if I can say, help people save some limbs, um, happy to do so. Cool. Uh, before we take the next question from Corey, I'll throw mine in there. It's called why we sleep. Uh, I finished reading it a couple weeks ago or a couple yeah. days ago. Um, it just, it, it's one of those books that changed the way I thought about something I thought I knew quite a bit about. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, it was, it was definitely an eye opener for I sure. I saw that on uh, Tomas Tomuz's uh, blog. He, he listed that one. Yeah. If you don't want to listen to the, the whole book, I listened to the book. It was great. Um, the Joe Rogan did a, did a podcast with Dr. Chris Martin. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. So that out. That's a good, it's like a, it's a, it's a two hour podcast. So you're like, you know, the book to, to listen to the book, you're only eight hours. Um, but so make your call from there. Yeah. The time you got. Um, so Corey's asking, you know, what's the best use of video for engaging with prospective clients? Yeah, I'm a, a big fan of the uh, Vidyard Videolicious, like Bright Coves of the world and how they integrate and um, being able to do one-to-one -one personalized video through email. be great if we can get that going through. I think you can do it through LinkedIn, but I never have. Um, and I'm not sure if I've seen it effective yet. Um, but video is also really good in embedding in LinkedIn posts, like uh, you know status updates. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a huge fan of using LinkedIn to build your funnel. And so that's another really good way to do it. So if you can do video on a topic that's, that adds value and then CC or um, tag your prospects and customers that you think would find it value, I think that's another uh, really good way to leverage it. Right. And I think to your point earlier, it has to make sense from a dollar, dollars and cents perspective. It yeah. needs to be like if you're doing this for $6,000 a year customers, you're, you're losing money. Right. Yeah. This has got to be sort of enterprise level deals we're talking. Yeah. I see a question here from Tom. Um, so he's asking, my example of the difference between a sales ops person and an outside salesperson is very good. Can you discuss, the, uh, discuss other examples? Also, perhaps some other techniques for guessing the psychological profile of your target ICPs. So we pulled 800 people in our, I mean, we sent it out to our, our list and 800 people responded uh, for Sales Hacker, but we built this buyer engagement guide based on the survey results and we pulled people on age on um, revenue ranges on title um, on how they liked to buy most and uh, so that's where I got the ops stuff from because ops people didn't like to be texted didn't like to be in like our our analysis of that was that they don't they're not in their phones versus salespeople and executives who found it you know okay so if you want, um, it's free. You can download it at saleshacker.com slash buyer. But it's this really awesome buyer engagement survey done with real data from decision makers um, across 800 different companies. And um, so you can check that out. But I'll have a, a lot more information about you know, where people get their uh, information from when they are in a sales process, whether it's peer review sites or forums um, or media companies or white papers or eBooks or webinars. And it also tell you about how people like to buy in terms of, you know, do the marketers like getting swag or getting hit up on Facebook or getting one-to-one -one video? Do salespeople, do ops people, do executives? So that's how we broke it down. So you can find more answers there. Cool. Oh, I love that. I think you make, making it so easy to digest the content. Yeah. Um, if I could suggest a hard alternative that's not as easy, um, the Miller Hyman's new strategic sale goes in depth about how you build a psychological profile uh, of your ICP. Um, it's a, uh, the book is probably like, it's the, it's, it's only about this thick. If you're listening, I don't know, maybe it's an inch and a half, two inches thick. It's the, it probably took me the longest to get through. Cause it's just one of those, you just, you read a chapter or even a couple of pages, you just got to sit and think. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember reading it and thinking, Oh man, I've screwed up every sale in my pipeline. <laughs> Um, but it's sort of that realization of, you know, you, you got to get to there before you can start improving things. Um, yeah, it gave me a great yeah. framework. Awesome. All right. What do we think? We got, uh, got time for probably two more here. Um, any ones that are piquing your fancy here? Pique your interest. Yeah, jo Joaquin, Joaquin Rios, um, Joaquin, 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 
Um, uh, yeah, I would tag him. I would tag prospects and LinkedIn posts. Say, hey, I thought you might find this interesting. Maybe it's not in the body post. Maybe it's in the comments. Uh, uh, but I don't see why not. Um, you're, if you've never spoken to them and they're ignoring you, then your name is coming up. So, you know, when we spoke before about how um, in, inbox inbound marketing for SMBs was just like that kind of spray and pray model. There is this thing in advertising called the law of effective frequency, um, or it's the um, effective frequency or the law of sevens. And it means it takes seven, it makes, it takes people seven times to see your brand or your name before they recognize it. So if you're tagging them and it comes up on their, you know, LinkedIn notifications, if you're um, going into their inbox and they're even deleting your email, they're seeing your name, they're seeing your brand. So you want to just make sure that they can see you as much as possible. Now you want to be adding value. So hopefully when they see it, it it's associated with something valuable. Um, but it's better. It really is better than nothing unless you're just com sending complete garbage and annoying the hell out of somebody, especially if they tell you to stop and you keep doing it. Mm -hmm. Great point, man. Um, all right. So there was one I had lined up here and then I looked away. So I think, uh, Jeff here is asking, seems like everything is a team buy, no, no matter how big or small the customer is. Any thoughts on how we help salespeople make it easier for their customers to buy? Oh man, there's a million different answers here. I think that the easiest thing you can do though is, is understand that um, you're selling to a person first, then an employee, then a company. So when you sell to the person, you know, you have to build a relationship, you have to build a rapport, they have to trust you, so you have the trust. The second thing is the employee. So you actually have to empower them to help them sell their company. You need to make them feel like a hero inside their company for making this decision. So there's an old saying, nobody ever got fired for buying IBM because it was a safe thing to do. And so if they just did the same thing over and over again, you know, they'd be in a, they'd, they'd be fine. They'd be in a good place. They're not going to lose their job. So what are you going to do to make them look like a hero for buying your risky product? when they couldn't have, they, they didn't have to buy and they could have been just fine and they wouldn't lose their job. But if they buy your product, they could lose their job, but they could also get promoted. They could also be the winner. They could be the hero of the story because your product makes them hundred X something that they weren't doing well before. So that's how you do the, the employee. And then the company is the pain points and all the other stuff that we went through before that's selling the company. And you have to empower, empower that person. You have to it's champion empowerment. They're your champion or your hero. And that's where it comes in where you need to make sure you have the, the collateral and the things in place to do that, you know, an ROI calculator so that finance can get on board or things like that, that just go into, uh, into the deal cycle to make it easier for everybody to everybody in the organization to say, this is a win. Great, Max. We got one last question and I picked this one. I know there's lots of other good questions we didn't get to answer, but I know this is something that Max is really passionate about. Um, so Bradley's asking about asking for tips for an SDR with one year of experience. Uh, and they want to move into a AE role in enterprise sales. What are, what's some advice you'd have for Bradley? Um, do you want to, if you want to move into an AE role in your company, uh, I would go to your superiors and just say like, Hey, give me a plan. Give, show me what it will take to get me to be an AE and what my timeline looks like. And let's agree upon that right now. So we're on the same page. And then you'll have your, your roadmap. You'll know exactly what you need to do to be, become an AE and move up in your career and know when it's going to happen. I think the, the, what, what makes people unmotivated or discouraged is not knowing, you know, what their timeline is going to be to get a promotion, not knowing how long it's going to take and not knowing what they need to do. So, you know, they're doing the wrong things. They're focusing on the wrong stuff. They're not spending time with other AEs. Um, I'd say like, if you're, if you're trying to move up in general and it's not going to be at that company, um, you want to find, you want to put yourself in as many positions as possible to be in closing conversations. So like ride along with your AE, if you can on as much as you possibly can, even if it's a shadow or, or something like that, uh, you're on your lunch break and they're on a call. Listen in on the call, like while you're eating lunch, as much as you can to learn how to do that. Because if you do move from an SDR to an AE role outside your company to a different company, I mean, you're going to need to learn that pretty quick on the fly. So you're going to, you're going to have to learn at your current company. That's great, man. I think, and, uh, and, and I got another one for Ann also. So, and you just got to land and expand to, so Ann wrote any tips. If you have several products to pitch medium sized business, trying to ID when, where someone could have interest when you have limited time. Um, land and expand. Figure out 
figure out what their pain, man, main pain point is, get in there and then expand. Quick answer on that one. Yeah. Perfect. I, I know you've got to get back to a conference. I have to jump to catch a flight. Max, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show today, bud. Anytime. Thanks for having me. All right, dude. Congrats on the acquisition and uh, thank have you. fun at Outreach, dude. Yeah. So far, so good. All, All right. right. See you.